Hello everybody, this is Grandmaster Max Sillingworth here, and I just remembered the most amazing attacking game that really inspired me when I was a young child. I think I was nine years old when I saw this brilliancy by Emil Sotovsky in the new in chess magazine, so I'd like to share this childhood memory with you now. And also, this uh, video will really help you if you're looking for a system against the Sveshnikov in terms of avoiding this opening and setting your opponent problems in different territory. So Sotovsky start with the move knight c3. Uh, you could also start with knight f3 of course. So knight c6, knight f3 was played. And here black played the move e5, trying to exploit white's move order by not letting white play d4. It's true it does pay the price of being the d5 square is a little bit weak. But this has, for example, been played by Carlson in many high-level games recently. Uh, another point I should point out is if Black plays knight f6 to try to transpose back into the open Sicilian, well, we don't have to play d4. Uh, we can play an improved Rossellimo with bishop b5. And the current verdict is that white does seem to have a small edge in this variation with best play. Uh, there was even a nice Caruana Carlson game recently in this line which I might well share in a future video, as it was a very instructive win by White. Now, returning to the game, we had e5, White played bishop c4, Black played d6, uh, so d6, d3, bishop to e7, and here White played the move castles. Uh, the other plan is to try to bring the knight towards the d5 square, as Fiddler did recently against Carlsen. So after castles, black played knight to f6, and so far we're seeing a fairly standard kind of development from both sides. And the point is that even though this d5 square is a little bit weak, it's not that easy for white to exploit it. And if we did go in with the knight, black would simply swap it off quite easily. So white decided that to make use of his slightly more active piece development, they needed some kind of pawn break here. So what do you think was the move that White played in this position? Well done if you found the move knight to g5. Now, normally knight g5 is not the best idea when they can castle and reply. Uh, you probably know already that if White were to take twice on f7, uh, say we play out the moves, that this would be a very favorable exchange for Black, who basically has 6.75 uh, pawns worth of material for white 6. So white's idea instead is to play f4 and clear the way for the f-pawn so that the rook can also join the pressure against the black king. So if black played e takes f4, I think nowadays they mainly play bishop g4 and this sort of the way in which black plays for equality. <clears throat> I remember that e f4 is actually a move that I was playing as a junior when I was uh, playing the Sveshnikov all the time. And yeah, I played this, also played this move h6 in my own games. Looking at it now, I'm, I guess, a bit more, uh, a bit more wise. And I would say instinctively that h6 does just create this almost imperceptible, but still quite serious weakening of Black's king side. At least this is what we'll see in the game. So after bishop e6, we come to this position, which I remember getting in a couple of my games, actually. Uh, both over the board and online, and in general my opponents didn't really know how to deal with this tension between the bishops. So let's see if you can do better. What would be a good move for white in this position to deal with the tension between the bishops? So it's your chance to pause the video if you need more time to think about it. So let's rule out some of the inferior moves. Uh, Bishop b6 is a move that we're fairly happy to see as black as black strengthens his central control with the recapture. And maybe the idea was to play e5 and try to weaken the black structure this way. The problem is it just doesn't work tactically, because if you play knight e5, you run into a nasty fork of queen d4. And after the king gets out of check, white will lose a piece. So when you play f4, you do have to be a bit careful of this attack down the diagonal. It's why some you will see moves such as king h1 in many openings after f4 has been played, just to get off the diagonal. 
Uh, if white plays a developing move here, such as queen to d2, well then black is, I think, doing okay here. Uh, in fact, there's even a very clever fork trick where you can play knight takes e4, saying that d4 will lose the pawn, but that after knight e4 and d5, that black does regain his piece with interest, and if anyone's better here, it is probably black, thanks to his bishop pair and good central control. So rather than developing, white played a very nice move of knight d5, and after seeing that black wants to play d5 and liquidate the uh, d5 outpost, well, we can kind of see the logic behind this move. And admittedly, the move bishop d5, while it's the most common one, may not necessarily be the best, where it might be better for black to play a defensive move like rook e8, but even then white still has a nice momentum, and after queen d2, you can get your rook in, and maybe even later a bishop h6 sack could end up being an interesting attacking idea, uh, for example. Uh, or if you want to play more positionally, you can also grab the bishop pair and claim a very modest edge that way, perhaps. But this is not what happened in the game. Uh, instead, black played bishop takes d5. And here is where white got to show his uh, creative idea. Where he played the move e takes d5. Uh, and really, I think the current theoretical verdict is that bishop d5 is a bit more promising. Saying that if uh, black does play takes, then you kind of take. And sort of black has a few problems activating his pieces because of the space. And white does seem to score very well here in recent games. So it's something that the theoreticians may like to explore in their own time. But ed5 is sort of one of these moves that... It's kind of in some ways a more beautiful move, and it leads to a very nice attack. So black played the move knight a5, which... In retrospect, might not be the best move here. Where I think that maybe knight b4 was a better try. To try and go after this d5 pawn. Although even here I suspect white would have a very strong attack with bishop d2. And then you can sack a pawn, but when your knight gets to f5, you will have a very strong attack. Based on the fact that, you know, in this position, for example, the reason a knight on f5 is so strong is an attacking piece, and the reason that Kasparov often said that the knight on f5 was worth a pawn is that you can't really kick it away so easily with g6 because of the fact that the h6 pawn is on. So it's something you may like to explore more deeply yourself. Very a lot of nice games in this variation, for sure. But the most beautiful, in my opinion, is the one that we'll see here between Sotovsky and Smirin from the 2002 Israeli Team Championship. So after knight a5, what would be your move for white in this position? So in the game, white played knight h4, which is sort of the move I kind of want to make work, and that it does have a direct idea of going for knight f5. It may well be that objectively a move like a3 also has merit, just to try and make the bishop move away. And to prompt takes, and... I mean, you can still go for this plan of perhaps going for knight to f5. Though maybe, in fairness, black's position is also not so bad if he just develops his pieces, and you know, kind of doesn't let white clamp down on that f5 square, as we'll see in the game. So, in this position, after knight a5 and the game move knight h4, Black played this move of b5, which it's a good try, but probably the best option for Black is to play his little tactic of takes. And and here it's kind of important to sort of play knight d5 and use the discovered attack. And this is a position I think I had in a rapid game many years ago uh, against my friend David Webster. Or uh, well, it wasn't exactly this position, but a very similar one. And White does have a bit of an initiative because of his more active pieces. But Black can sort of trade off the pieces and because of the fact White has the doubled pawns on the Queen side. His majority is not that valuable and objectively Black should be fine in this position. Uh, so instead of going for the simpler quality, Smirin played in a more aggressive style. And it's one to keep in mind with both of these players that they both basically really like to fight for the initiative and play very aggressively. And it's one reason they've both played a lot of very exciting and fascinating games in their careers. But in this case, b5 is just objectively not that good, I think, because of the move that white played, 
where he didn't play to automatic bishop b5, which would allow black to take the initiative with knight d5. So what do you think he played instead? Well done if you wanted to play the piece sacrifice knight to f5. And yes, we are giving up a piece, but it turns out that the knight is very strong on this f5 square. And later sort of theory showed that the move queen e1 is quite a nice move to attack the bishop and go for queen g3. But in this game, white went for the jugular with the move bishop h6. And I mean, on a practical level, it's very hard to deal with this sort of attack where the pieces are just flooding in and you know these pieces are just not really participating in a defense of the black king. I think black already has to take that bishop because if he plays knight to e8, for example, then, I mean, he could already play moves like queen g4 and you know, just bring more pieces in the attack. You know, also, rook a1 can, a1 can come in and, I mean, at least on a practical level, this attack looks extremely scary and I wouldn't want to defend this position at all as black. In fact, I think you already have to play g6 and give up some of the material that black has taken before. So instead of that, what black did was he took the bishop and relied on his ability to defend with the two extra pieces. So I played knight h6, taking the pawn with a tempo. And after king f8, after king to h7, white just played this quiet move of knight f5. But we can sort of see now that the knight can't really be assailed from f5. And white just has this very easy plan of bringing the pieces in the attack with moves like the rook lift and also the queen lift as well. And it's just a very tough position for black to defend here. In fact, I think he only has one move to save himself. And, well, I don't know if there are any grandmasters who are, who are watching my videos. But there's a fun little challenge. What do you think would be the, the best move for black in this position? And this one you'll definitely want to pause the video and think about a lot. So if you have no idea what to do, I might offer the hint that you might like to try and eliminate the clearly bad options, and that might help you come up with the best one. So in the game, black was admittedly too greedy, and he played the move c takes d3, which we'll get to a bit later. I would say, in retrospect, black probably had to find the move rook to g8 in this position, with the idea of using the rook to cover the king and... Okay, maybe it's too optimistic to hope for a counterattack, but the rook is at least facing toward the white king here. I guess in that case, white would probably go queen to e1. And here, with the threat of not just the bishop, but also the threat of queen h4 and mate like this, I think black has to play knight takes d5, and my conclusion is that black is just about surviving after queen e4 you know, with a slew of threats here. So black has to play this move, bishop f6, it's the only move. And after, say, queen takes d5, uh, it might look tempting to go for a discovered check here. Uh, at merely 97, is maybe not such a bad move, actually, to get the knight to d5. But black seems to save himself here with the move rook to g6 is uh, one fun idea. And if, say, knight d5, then it seems that black is just about able to hold on where he will be giving back some material with knight e7, uh, for example. But then black can save himself with the queen trade of queen e6 and you know, basically give back his material but reclaim the initiative to hold. Now it's true, it looks quite easy here because I have the engine turned on to show me the best moves. But to see all this in a practical game is really a tough exercise. And I mean, if you saw this line to queen e6, then you, you're obviously a very strong player and Congratulations for making it. Uh, if white does play queen d5, then I think black has to find this move queen f8. And, and it's one thing, I mean, you sort of don't have to see all of this when you play this as white. I think to calculate the consequence of this whole knight f5 sack is virtually impossible. But you can sort of get a feel for how the attack might play out uh, in a game. And how if black doesn't find the right move every single move, he has big problems. And to be honest, even here, I think white still has a very strong initiative. Uh, maybe even just d take c4 is a good move. Getting a second pawn for the piece, and you can choose between just gobbling up the black pawns, or maybe even bring the other rook in the attack, make sure that every piece is involved in the fight, 
which is a very good principle to follow when you do have an attack on the enemy king, or even just in general. I mean, it makes sense. You don't want to leave any of your friends out of your party as such. Uh, just we don't want to leave any of our pieces out of the game. So returning to the game, I mean, there are other moves. Black can play like King H8 and Rook H8, but you know, I don't want this to be like a one-hour video and you, know, you probably also want to have something to do after uh, after watching this. So let's see the, the real action that we came here for. So we had C takes D3, and White played Queen takes D3, uh, threatening discovered check, Knight takes E7. So Black got out of that with King H8. Uh, he's also playing this move so that he can meet Queen H3 with Knight to H7 and block the uh, check on the King. And okay, I've already kind of hinted at what White should do in this position. But what's the key move for White to win the game here? Okay, it turns out there are a lot of winning moves. So if you want to play Queen G3 and go for mate that way, it would also be winning. But the move that's particularly strong here is Rook A to E1. And it follows this principle I mentioned just before of bringing every single piece in the attack. And it transpires that Black doesn't really have a good way to defend this bishop. Uh, in fact, he tried a desperate Queen B6 in the game. But you're probably wondering what if black plays rook to e8, what's the winning move here? Uh, I won't say it as a puzzle, because there's actually a lot of winning continuations. But a really instructive one is to play the deadly quiet move, queen c3, with the threat of playing rook takes e7 and going for mate on g7. And there's just no way for black to defend this, because if he does play bishop f8, we just deflect the queen away from the knight with rook takes e8. And in a position like this, it's just a matter of sort of bring the final piece in the attack with tempo. Uh, you might not want to start with rook e3 because queen e1 could be an annoying check in that case. But you can avoid it with tempo by playing queen g5. Okay, there are many winning lines, but the clearest is to play queen h4. And then we're kind of ready to either play rook f3 with queen, this queen move stopped. Or even better, we can go for a lawnmower mate with queen g3. And after rook f4, there's just no good defense to the threat of rook to h4. Uh, and yeah, black is just getting mated here. So black tried the move queen b6 instead. And in that case, well, white played the move queen h3, uh, continuing the attack with tempo. Turns out that queen g3 first is also winning for white. Uh, black played knight to h7. Uh, skip to move knight h7, and rook takes e7, and I mean, you can just feel the energy of white's pieces here, where, I mean, black can't even take the pawn on b2, because knight d6, and you know, once white takes that pawn on f7, you know, it's all these pieces in the attack against was almost a lone king. So even without really calculating it, you can sort of feel that white is just completely crushing here. If black does try queen at d4, and they try to get greedy with queen d5. Yeah, then you play knight f7. And I mean, if king g8, then you just have knight h6. And, and okay, here's a, a fun puzzle for all of you watching. Now, pretty much every decent look, move kind of wins here for white. But what's the way to force checkmate from this position? And to give you a hint, it's a mate in 5 by force. So well done if your move was rook h7. Just clearing the last defender of Black's king. And you might notice that the queen and the knight just make a amazing you know, attacking duo. Uh, knight f7 is also winning by force, by the way. It's also mating just as quickly. After knight to f5, uh, Black might play me like king g6. Then we can play, say, queen g4 or queen h6. Either one will come to the same thing. King f7 and then you have queen g7. And already you can pre-move queen e7 mate, whichever way that the king goes. So a very nice attacking sequence. Now let's see what happened in the game. So I had c4 check. Okay, it's only a spite check. Go king b1. Queen to b2 and... Here you can still play knight d6 and it's still completely winning for white, just as we saw before. But rook e4 is, I guess, the more stylish way to win. And... The point is that the rook is just coming to h4 and white-black just doesn't have a good way to defend his knight. 
if he does try queen f6, then we'll just play rook h4 and after rook to queen g6. There are various moves that win for white. You can even grab some material back if you want to. Or you can even play rook h6 and you know, if black plays queen g8, then it's still queen c3 or that can be a really strong move, for example. It's a position where you know, white's attack is so strong that you know, all roads lead to Rome. So black tried the move rook g8 and his idea was to try and meet rook h4 with something like rook g7 and try to mount a defense this way. But it turns out white actually has a forced checkmate and okay, I know you're going to really love this one. So what's the way for white to mate in no less than six moves? I know a six move checkmate might sound a bit difficult, but every move I believe does come with a check, so it makes it a bit easier to calculate. And it's sort of advice I often give to uh, my students that when you know it as a tactic, or even just as a general calculating technique, you want to look at the checks and captures first, because A, they're easier to calculate, but B, if there is going to be a immediately winning continuation, it's almost certainly going to be something like a check or a capture or a threatening move. So the move white played here is queen takes h7. And it's all very forcing from here, where black resigned in the game, but just so you can see the whole sequence, it was king h7, rook h4, king g6, rook h6, king g5. And after h4, you might see the mate coming now. So king g4, and now white plays knight e3. That's not always so easy to see the backward checks. And after king g3, I'm the rook f3 mate. Which I think you agree is just a really wonderful finish to this game. And this is a really amazing game that, I mean, it really inspired me as a nine-year-old in 2002, just when I was starting to play some serious chess tournaments. And to be honest, it still inspires me today to see, you know, all these attacking principles come into play in one game, where we saw it from, you know, the importance of getting that knight to f5 and attacking the black weaknesses in his camp. And then we kind of saw... You know, it's a really instructive point that it's easier to think that we always have to make a threatening move when we're attacking their king, so they can't bring the attackers to the defense. But then there are a lot of situations like this where, you know, A, black can't too easily cover his king anyway due to lack of pawn cover, and B, our attack is just that much stronger if we have every single piece in the attack rather than just trying to mate with, say, the queen and knight. Which, I mean, are a very good attacking duo, as we saw, but they can't always carry the game by themselves. Where something to every single player to play their part, uh, just like in a team sport. So uh, yeah, I hope you really enjoyed this video. I realize this is one of my longer videos uh, compared to the others. So I want to congratulate you for making it to the end. And you know, if you're still uh, you know really excited, and energetic after this, then good for you. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. As always, if you're really liking this content then it'd be really great you know, both for you and for me if uh, if you subscribe so that you can stay updated with this content and so I know that I'm my videos are being watched and are making a difference so thanks everyone and I'll see you in the next video